Around 8 p.m. on March 4th, 1982, actors Robert De Niro and Harry Dean Stanton stopped by the famed Chateau Marmont on the Sunset Strip to visit their friend John Belushi. Belushi was 33 and enormously famous, and the Chateau, with its star-studded roster of guests and palatial rooms, was his home away from home when he was in L.A. Belushi had been holed up at the Chateau's luxurious Bungalow 3 for five days, supposedly working on the script for a new project called Noble Rot, but in fact he spent almost all of his time partying with friends. De Niro and Stanton knocked on the door and it was opened by a woman named Kathy Smith, a local celebrity hanger-on and drug dealer who the actors knew well but did not like. The room was trashed, empty wine bottles and pizza boxes littered the surfaces and dirty laundry covered the floor, and there were drugs everywhere. Bags of heroin by the TV and lines of coke laid out on a small side table. De Niro snorted a line and then asked Belushi to join them for dinner at the iconic West Hollywood steakhouse Dantana's, followed by a night of partying at the club called On the Rocks. Belushi said he wasn't feeling up to it. De Niro and Stanton went on their way, eventually meeting up with a young comedian named Robin Williams, who had just performed an impromptu set at the Comedy Store, and they told him about Belushi's situation. Williams, never one to pass up a party, drove to the Chateau and dropped in on Bungalow 3, where he chatted with Belushi and Smith, did a few lines of Belushi's cocaine, and headed home around 3 a.m. Later that morning, a room service waiter delivered breakfast to Bungalow 3, Smith signed for it, ate, cleaned the rooms of drugs and paraphernalia, and slipped out around 10.15, leaving, she claimed, a snoring Belushi in the bedroom. At noon, Belushi's personal trainer and bodyguard, Bill Wallace, crossed the hotel grounds and entered Bungalow 3 through the unlocked sliding glass door. He found Belushi naked in bed, unconscious and not breathing. He performed CPR and then, in a scene reminiscent of the death of Heath Ledger, didn't call 911, but opted instead to phone Belushi's agent, Bernie Brillstein. Brillstein first called his personal physician and directed him to the chateau, but then, after hearing again from Wallace about the severity of Belushi's condition, called paramedics. By then, however, there was nothing that could be done. John Belushi, just 33 years old, was pronounced dead at the scene. I'm Jason Beckerman. I'm Derek Kaufman. And this is Last Days, John Belushi. So according to Kathy Smith, who later spoke candidly about Belushi's last days, Belushi paid her $15,000 for the few days that they spent together at the Chateau, not just for the heroin and cocaine, but also the services of mixing the drugs to form what's known as a speedball, and then injecting the mixture into his arm. So for people who aren't familiar with this, a speedball, a heroin is a downer, cocaine is an upper. Sometimes if you combine the two, you can party for a longer period of time and get the effects of both drugs in your system. The coroner's report later confirmed the obvious. Belushi had died from acute cocaine and heroin intoxication and said he had multiple fresh needle puncture marks on both arms. It also noted in the report that Belushi was in very poor physical condition, suffering from congestion of the lungs, liver and spleen, swelling of the brain, an enlarged heart, aortic arteriosclerosis, a distended bladder, and obesity. He was five foot eight and nearly 250 pounds, just 33 years old, Jason. I mean, this was a big guy, so it begs the comparison to another star from SNL, Chris Farley. So we talked about Chris Farley a couple weeks ago, and Chris, also five foot eight, he weighed even more, up to 300 pounds, and he admitted that he modeled his career and much of his life after John Belushi. He had said, if you recall, during the episode we did on Farley, that he talked about wanting to go out like John Belushi did because he admired not necessarily the death, I think it was a little hyperbole there, but the life, the going full bore, kind of doing it, parting right, being an incredible uh, comedian, but living the life like Belushi had led. I think that's right. They'll always be linked together because of being the large, funny guys on SNL during a period of time. I think temperamentally, they were very, very different. We'll explore this in this episode. You'll remember Chris Farley was sort of riddled with insecurities and self-doubt. A lot of people who talk about Chris Farley uh, compare him to the character on the Chris Farley show skit where he was nervous talking to other celebrities. That was, they say, the closest thing to real Chris Farley. Belushi was was brilliant. He was a man in full. He He, was a He was the most confident person on the entire SNL set. Rub people the wrong way sometimes. Could be a diva. His lack of confidence, uh, his tremendous confidence could be a diva. Also, 
Farley never reached the heights of fame that Belushi that Belushi had reached by this point in their lives. SNL was already an institution yeah, by the right. time Chris Farley arrived on the scene, and he sort of uh, perpetuated the legacy of that show, but John Belushi created it. Right. I mean, quite simply, you had the not ready for primetime players. That was John Belushi, and right. he was the center star of the first installment of, 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 SN, of SNL. And there's this, uh, you know, sort of... His skits were different than Chris Farley. Chris Farley was always jumping on a table. The physicality was always front and center. And while John Belushi had that gear, he was also quite cerebral. You would see, we'll talk about the skits with about Beethoven and so forth. You'd never see Chris Farley playing Beethoven. Right. (laughs) To appreciate the magnitude of the loss of John Belushi, we really should try to comprehend the impact he once had on America. In the mid to late 70s, he embodied the American counterculture. There's a famed culture critic from the time called Juan Sanguino, and he observed, quote, during an era of mistrust in the institution and a crisis of values, after Nixon's fall and the incapacity of Jimmy Carter, the U.S. found a vehicle for its catharsis in Belushi. His humor was unpredictable, anarchic, uncomfortable, anti-system, surrealist, impulsive. His greatest discovery was bringing street humor to television, making the public at large laugh at the rough jokes people would tell. Belushi had been raised uh, in Chicago, a middle-class family, uh, always a funny kid. By the early 70s, he had started his own comedy troupe and then sort of parlayed that into an invite to the famed Second City improv group. And later was picked up in the National Lampoon Radio Hour, where he became close with Harold Ramis and Bill Murray, Gilda Radner, Richard Belzer. And then during a trip to Toronto to check out the local Second City cast in 1974, he met Dan Aykroyd, and the two became lifelong friends, partners, collaborators. In 75, Lord Michaels, who had just been hired to produce a sketch comedy TV show called Saturday Night Live, heard about Belushi but didn't think his physical humor would fit the show he was envisioning. He was envisioning a more cerebral show, and from what he knew about Belushi, he was just a physical comedian. He just had one audition for Belushi, though, and he was absolutely blown away. At age 26, Belushi was cast as one of the seven original cast members. This is a great piece of trivia here. Who are the seven original cast members right. of SNL? It's uh, Belushi, Lorraine Newman, Gilda Radner, Jane Curtin, Garrett Morris, Dan Aykroyd, and Chevy Chase. There's this really poignant, before we move on, there's this really poignant sketch where John Belushi plays an old version of himself. Have you ever seen it yes. where he's got the gray hair and the mustache and he's visiting the tombstones of all the original cast members? Yeah. The poignancy, of course, is that he was the first to pass. Right. He lived the, the, the shortest life. Life, and all of these other cast members lived uh, pretty long lives. So the show was an enormous hit. Uh, each of its cast members became a star in some sense, uh, but Belushi really stood head and shoulders above the rest. He was a gigantic star with a big personality and the quintessential physical comic, quick, unpredictable. His movements were so- sort of propulsive without ever seeming beyond his control, like Chris Farley in a lot of ways. Yeah, um, He was manic and large. He had that dancer's grace. He was always in control while entertaining a world that seemed anything but. His iconic characters, such as Samurai Futaba, and Jake Blues. He uh, he impersonated figures. He was very, very versatile. He would do this Joe Cocker uh, impression that was incredible. Joe Cocker had that screaming voice, uh, did, you know, the theme song to the Wonder Years uh, song. He could do him And they were the first people that I ever saw he and Cocker get on stage together where the the impressionist gets on, sort of surprise, you know, at least pretend surprises. Yes. The actual individual. Tina Fey did this with Sarah Palin much later, Hillary Clinton much later, or... um, who did it with Hillary Clinton? Uh, uh, to, uh, uh, with uh, Amy Poehler. With Amy Poehler, yes. Right. They, these were the first ones that I ever saw do. It was great because Belushi could do as good a Cocker as Cocker could do. And you had Cocker. to have real talent. Right. So Joe Cocker is a real singer, a professional right. who earned his money that way, but but he could sort of go toe-to-toe to him singing. He did a Marlon Brando. These are all sort of instant classics. But he soon became best known as the uncompromising owner of the Olympia restaurant that had only one thing on the menu. Let's go. We're going to have third We want a cheeseburger? Come on. Everybody got a cheeseburger. You want a cheeseburger? Come on. Cheeseburger? I, I, I want a cheeseburger. It's too early for a cheeseburger. It's too early for a cheeseburger? Look. You listen to that sketch, and yes, sort of the com- comedy has changed since then, but the stuff is still very, very funny. You it can is. see the scaffolding of what SNL would become just by these early years, and that's a good example of that kind of skit. So two years into the show's run, it's 1978, Belushi and Aykroyd debuted their new musical act, The Blues Brothers, as the musical guest for one of the episodes. So SNL always has a musical guest. They were the musical right. guest that episode. Uh, featuring their unsmiling alter egos, Jake and Elwood Blues, Belushi and Aykroyd performed a cover of the classic Sam and Dave song. You heard it at the top of this podcast, Soul Man. And it was 
an absolute sensation out of the gate. Uh, Belushi sang lead vocals. As we said, if he did that Cocker impression, he could actually sing. Right. And Aykroyd could play the harmonica. And so their first album they released is called Briefcase Full of Blues, became a number one album in America. You have to sort of marvel at that. These guys are just doing cover songs of classic blues hits, and they are incredible. Nailing they can it. both sing. They can both play a lot of instruments. Uh, Belushi could play the piano. Uh, Aykroyd, famously a great harmonica and guitarist. And also, they were incredibly nimble dancers. It doesn't show up on the audio of the album, obviously, but in person, they were both incredibly nimble. We talked about, you know, Belushi having that da- those dancers' feet. They were both, and Aykroyd was a spectacular dancer. Watch the old footage of them doing the Blues Brothers concerts. Aykroyd is sensational dancer. They both were. It's incredible. They're both so young, because we think of Aykroyd, right. or I think of him as an older actor when he got a little sort of heftier yeah. and he wasn't moving around as much. In their in their heyday, they were nimble on stage. The album goes double platinum, so it really sold as a musical act. And to me, this is also the genesis of uh, the... The, a skit turning into a real phenomenon, right. and and they they created that. Now we've seen that so commonly in in the '90s. Obviously, a bunch of the characters uh, were parlayed into movies. It started with the Blues Brothers, and their first single, "Hey Bartender," was actually an enormous hit unto itself. I think we think of it as a comedy skit. This was like just presented as music. They were yeah. comedians on SNL, but they were also musicians. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. So at the same time that Belushi is doing SNL, he's flying during the week. We saw this with Chris Farley as well, doing the same thing, flying over to Oregon, I believe, to do the filming for National Lampoon's Animal House. This is a huge movie production that's happening in Oregon during the same time he's doing SNL. Animal House is produced at a cost of $2.8 million. The movie grossed over $120 million at the box office, making it the single most profitable movie ever made up until that time. It's incredibly staggering. Think, yes. think about that. We're talking about like um, what was uh, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, these yes. movies with very small budgets that do huge numbers. This was the paled in comparison. Paled in comparison to this. Belushi's portrayal of the hard parting and anarchistic Bluto Blutarski made him one of the most beloved and iconic characters in movie history. Over? Did you say over? Nothing is over until we decide it is. Was it over when the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor? Hell no! Germans? Forget it, he's rolling. And it ain't over now. Because when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Who's with me? Let's go. Come on. Have you ever been to a Dodger game when they play that? Yeah, of course. It's incredible. It's it stands up. So, Derek, there's an argument to be made here. I want to he- get your take on this, that John Belushi may have been the biggest star in the world during this very brief moment in time. He's got, he's the biggest star by far on the biggest late night television show that ever has been. He's in the number one movie, the most, the highest pro- profiting movie of all time. And at the same time, he's got a number one album. I don't know if anybody's ever had that trifecta. I I think it's incredible. I think it's a really astute point. He is at the center of culture. I mean, there's no two bones about it. Uh, There are other people from that era of SNL. Chevy Chase was obviously very big at the time. He had some of the Fletch But he was there for one year and then left. But he was there for one and done. And he went off to film and he tried to become the biggest star. This guy had a foot in the most culturally important show on television. And he was a huge movie star at the same time. With the number one record. With a number one record. So he's also in music. I, I don't think there's anyone who is comparable to John Belushi at that moment in time. Now, whether he had the longevity, obviously not. But really during that moment, I think you're right. So, of course, though, Jason, where there's youth, fame, and wealth in the late 70s, there's also going to be drugs. And for no one was that more true than John Belushi. His use of cocaine was simply legendary. There's this infamous sketch from 1978 where Belushi plays Beethoven. I alluded to it earlier. And he's in the white powder wig and so forth. And he sniffs a line uh, off of off of his hand during the skit and then starts playing Ray Charles. It sort of it converts him, him from this yes. old timey German Classical. dude all of a sudden into Ray Charles because he sniffs a line of cocaine off of his hand. And the story behind that is, you know, this was a rough and tumble show. This is the 70s. That was a real line of coke. Yeah. Uh, and, and it was in front of an at home audience of 17 million viewers. Those numbers you don't see anymore, but in television back in the day, you had like three channels. A lot of eyeballs yeah. were watching John Belushi sniff cocaine. The on audience live didn't television. know it, but all of the actors and the producers have come out in the years since and said, You think Belushi had a problem? You don't know the half of it. 
he actually had lo- a lo- he actually had a vial of cocaine that he poured onto his hand. He was supposed to pretend to to snort coke. He snorted actual cocaine. On the it's set. an unbelievable story, given that it was on television in the 70s. So in 1979, while filming the Blues Brother movie, uh, he asked for and got a line item in the budget of the movie just to cover his cocaine expenses. He was spending a lot of money. We talked about the $15,000 he spent to Kathy Smith uh, on the, the days before his death. Dan Aykroyd said to Vanity Fair later, look. Everyone did it, including me. But John, he just loved what it did. It sort of brought him alive at night, that superpower feeling where you start to talk and converse and figure you can solve all the world's problems. And it's really quite telling to listen to that commentary. Everyone's doing coke. You know, we got uh, Robin Williams did the blows a line. Robert De Niro comes in the room. But the people who really love and feel energized by it can often become a problem in their lives. In 1984, Bob Woodward wrote this biography. It's very famous called Wired about John Belushi. Sushi, claiming he was spending $2,500 a week on the cocaine habit, which is just an enormous sum of money at the time. As his career begins to falter in the early 80s after the release of three notorious box office flops, uh, 1941, Continental Divide, and Neighbors, the financial strain starts to become very real in his life from having this cocaine habit and not ter- turning out movies that are making a huge profit. In Woodward's book, he references letters Belushi wrote to his wife, Judith Jacqueline, apologizing for the waste and promising he'll give up the drugs after the next movie. But of course, he didn't. He was bringing in a ton of money, but spending far more. And when checks would come in, he would just use the money to buy cocaine, sort of a hand to mouth existence, a paycheck to paycheck. When they didn't, he would still buy cocaine or find others to get it for him. Remember, he's enormously wealthy. He's yeah. powerful. He's very, uh, you know, sort of popular. He can get other people to get you drugs. And given his fame, there's plenty of people who were just contributing to his excesses. Penny Marshall uh, told Vanity Fair, I swear you'd walk down the street with him and people would hand him drugs. And then he performed for them, be the kind of character he played in sketches or Animal House. So Woodward also said that uh, Belushi was so wasted one Saturday night that Lorne Michaels called a doctor who warned him that Belushi might die if he performed on the show. And Lorne Michaels asked the doctor what the probability of death was. And the doctor said, you know, 50-50. Put yourself in this position. (laughs) You find out that your lead actor if he goes on stage at night, has a 50% chance a of death. A coin flip. A coin flip de- of death. So and what does Lauren Michael Michaels say? Do? Lauren Michaels said, I can live with that and wanted to roll the dice. I mean, he is a huge star. I think the attitude about drug use was different back right. then, but still, he's hearing this directly from a medical professional saying, I don't think he should go out. He could die. And Lauren says, let's roll the dice. Um, there was another story. Blues Brothers director John Landis once found Belushi asleep on the set in 1980, soaked in his own urine next to a pile of cocaine but of course in that instance as well the show went on so the next year after he films blues the blues brothers belushi meets the aforementioned kathy smith a professional hanger on as we said who traveled with groups like the band and the rolling stones she claimed to have been a do-it-all helper and drug supplier for the likes of ron wood and keith richards as well as for gordon lightfoot he died recently Uh, who she apparently dated for four years in the 1970s. She was known in these circles. She had a nickname, uh, Kathy Silverbag, because she always carried with her a little metallic purse filled with cocaine. She and Belushi met at an L.A. party in 1981, bonded over their shared love of sex and drugs, and they did plenty of both together. Whenever Belushi was in L.A., he and Kathy were together at the Chateau, including during the fateful five-day stretch in early March 1982 that culminated in John Belushi's death. A few hours, so we talked about how his personal trainer had discovered his body on the morning of the 5th and and called paramedics. A few uh, hours later, Smith returned to the Chateau, apparently unaware anything had happened, obviously long before the days of cell phones. News hadn't broke yet, so she comes back a couple of hours later, presumably going back to Bungalow 3 to see John. She was driving Belushi's car when she pulled up, which caught the eye of the hordes of police and media that were starting to gather. She was handcuffed and driven to police headquarters where she was questioned for two and a half hours. As you might expect, Smith's story minimized her own role in the assorted affair, and she was released later that day. It's a decision that really would come back to haunt the LAPD because it was later learned that she had been the person, as we talked about, who supplied the drugs and injected them into Belushi. But after a meeting with cops, Smith sort of realizing that she might have some real liability and was lucky to have been released. She quickly left L.A., first went to St. Louis and then New York, and eventually returned to her hometown of Toronto, Canada. 
While she was on the road, she was somehow tracked down by two National Enquirer reporters, uh, Tony Brenna and Larry Haley. They became very famous for this. For whatever reason, Smith gave a very candid and very detailed account to the reporters about a life with Belushi, including admitting to them that she injected Belushi with 11 speedballs in the days leading up to his death. The Enquirer published the article four months after Belushi's death under the headline, I killed John Belushi. I didn't mean to, but I am responsible. Can you imagine? I, I want to pause here a minute on Kath, Kathy Smith because I want to again bring up Chris Farley. Remember, he was also yeah. with a woman and doing drugs uh, the evening of his death. And you remember, she said that she left while he was alive, right. but took those horrific photos of a clearly sort of bloated corpse at that point. Yes. He does not look alive. I think Kathy Smith is somewhat different of a figure because when she left, she said he was snoring and she had ordered some breakfast and she returned. Yeah. So doesn't that go to her sort of state of mind that he was actually going to be okay and that she left a person who she thought was, although obviously high out of his mind, in good enough condition to return and, and yeah, party again. she'd been shooting him up for, for five days now and every day she had left and every day she had returned and every day John was there and finally ready to party again. I don't think she thought anything of it yeah. when she left that morning. Uh, he was sleeping, but, you know, it's a little different in that uh, in John Belushi's case, Kathy Smith was actually doing the injecting. Yeah. She was the one that was actually, she was actually, A, getting the drugs. Remember, Chris Farley was buying them from a drug dealer. She was the dealer in this case. And number two, she was actually uh, administering the injections to him. And it's just a, it, it creates a level of culpability that maybe wasn't, ex didn't exist in Chris Farley's case. As a result of the revelations in the article, the LAPD reopens the investigation into Smith and ultimately indicted her on 13 counts, including second degree murder and the unlawful administration of cocaine and heroin. She fights extradition from Canada, but ultimately does come back to the United States in June 1986 and ends up pleading guilty to involuntary manslaughter and several drug charges. Um, so it's interesting, you know, there's been no one who has, has who was held criminally responsible in the death of Heath Ledger, in the death of Chris Farley. But here we have someone who actually serves time for the for the death of John Belushi. One important footnote for journalism nerds like like Jason and myself uh, Kathy Smith's prosecutors subpoenaed the National Enquirer to get the reporter's interview notes and see everything Smith had told them during that interview. The Enquirer refused on grounds that the information was protected by the California source privilege, and Judge Brian Crahan threatened the reporters with incarceration if they didn't comply and hand over the information. The reporters nevertheless stood firm, and Crahan backed down, ultimately vacating the contempt order against them. It was an enormous win for investigative journalists and set a precedent that bars government access to reporter source material that we still use this, today. This is a huge deal in our business, right? That that law enforcement sometimes will want reporters' notes, will want to know who sources of information are, and you just don't. Journalists just don't give them out. And this was a case. This was at the early stages of the media source privilege really being ingrained into into law, into California law, as the case was in this case. And it was a really important case that sort of has benefited journalists ever, ever and since. And look, it makes a lot of sense. That is our relationship to the First Amendment. This is the way that journalists get access to information is by protecting their sources. Right. You only get these sorts of revelations if you can protect your sources. And it's it's an interesting case because it's still very relevant and it came up in the journalism. Anyway, a bit case. of an aside, but I thought it was kind of interesting, again, for journalism nerds like you and me. Of course. So, uh, so ever since he was found dead, Belushi's name has become synonymous with addiction and excess and really understandably yeah. so, as you've heard this episode. He consumed food and drugs without the first consideration of the consequences either to himself or his family. He would joke about this. Even you ever seen the little chocolate donut skit where yeah. he was like a, a runner who would just eat chocolate donuts. Yeah. But but just talking about that, like he, he has a wife who's on the East Coast, not out there while he's partying and having sex and everything with Kathy Smith. And then he's got a, a mother and a father and they're very young. He's only 33. And this was an Albanian immigrant family. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, his family, his parents are only in their late 50s, early 60s. And so that's why it's without the with the lack of appreciation of the consequence he was having for those people around him. A man of true excess. I think I think that's exactly right. But what's often lost when you discuss John Belushi because that so overwhelmed the narrative of his life is how profoundly he impacted comedy and popular culture. He reveled in challenging conventional norms in a way really no one before him had. Generations of boundary pushing comics idolized Belushi. Chris Farley, as we mentioned, Will Ferrell cites him, Melissa McCarthy, and others have talked about how he just changed comedy forever. Rolling Stone named him the greatest SNL cast member ever. And that's really telling. We've had Eddie Murphy. We've had Will Ferrell. Yep. We've had Adam Sandler. They named him number one on that list because of how important he was to the history of it and it existing for those other and actors. They, they, they really talked about without from. Belushi. We talked about that. We touched on this a minute ago. Without Belushi, SNL maybe doesn't survive, right? Yep. Chevy Chase and Belushi are the two biggest stars when it first starts. 
And Chevy Chase, Chase bolts. Leads, leads, and, and you know, by all accounts, Chevy Chase was one of the great assholes in, in, <laughs> to work with of all time. Yeah, apparently, remains he, as much. Right, yeah. right. So he leaves after season one. Belushi sticks around and creates these indelible characters over the next three or four years, and then hands it over to the next generation. Whereas, in, if, if but for Belushi, you wonder if the show could have sustained a success for those first few years it needed to do so. And you're right to your point about Chevy Chase left the show and and has had a terrific career. Yeah. I mean, he became a huge star. John Belushi had that opportunity as well. Yeah. He could have left the show and crippled it. I mean, it's not that Lorraine Newman and Gilda Radner aren't all talented, but you needed that fulcrum point, and John Belushi was it once Chevy, Ch- once so, Chevy so, Chase left. So Belushi leaves, and, and so what, what's the counterfactual? What happens in the event that that John Belushi survives that day. As we talked about with Chris Farley, it's hard to imagine a world where somebody living the way that he is lives much longer, right? Yeah, the counterfactual is difficult because of his life was so filled with excess that you can't imagine him uh, doing anything other than burning bright and dying young and leaving behind a good-looking corpse, as as he yeah. liked to say. He said that in that skit. Um, you know, I do like to think of him, though, as very different than Chris Farley. Um, And and in this way, he was very cerebral. He could have gone behind the camera. He was brilliant, not only as a physical comedian, but really as a thinker and a writer. He was an artist as well. He was a true artist. Sometimes you'll see pictures of him where he grew out this beard, and he looks like an entirely different kind of Mm -hmm. character uh, than than, uh, his usual antics on stage. And so I think he would have moved behind the camera. Dan Aykroyd actually talked about that. There's an interview with Aykroyd where they they asked him about this. You know, what would... They said, do you miss what you and he would have done together in front of the camera? And he goes, no, actually, what I what I think we lost most of all is Belushi being behind the camera as a director. And he talks about how cerebral he was, how smart he was, how many ideas he had, and how what an artist he was. And that, to Aykroyd, from a from a professional point of view, was the real loss of, uh, that, that uh, we suffered for John Belushi's death. Yeah, you miss the sort of comedy partnership that they would have had for decades, whether right. it was in front of the screen or behind it writing. You know, Dan Aykroyd wrote Ghostbusters. Right. I mean, these guys were by prolific. The way, Wrote that for he, um, uh, Belushi, Belushi, and Eddie Murphy was supposed to be the third character in that, and then Belushi dies, and, and Murphy had gone on and by that sure. point done other incredible things. So tying up a few loose ends here, there's some interesting postscripts on this. Belushi's funeral was held at an Albanian Orthodox church on a bitter cold late winter's day on Martha's Vineyard. Belushi liked to come there to unwind. He and Aykroyd were actually talking about buying property there where they would go and sort of create things and incubate ideas. A generation of comedy stars were among the mourners and pallbearers at the funeral. Aykroyd led the procession on his motorcycle. Bill Murray and Lorne Michaels openly wept. They threw flowers into his open grave. Kathy Smith, obviously not at the funeral, completed her 15 months in prison at the California Institution for Women and was released in March 1988. She was deported to Canada after her release and moved back to Toronto, where she worked as a legal secretary and spoke to teenagers about the danger of drugs. Way to turn something bad into something good, Kathy. Uh, She died in 2020 of natural causes, prompting the New York Times to dub her one of the most notorious footnotes in pop culture. Bungalow 3 at the Chateau Marmont is still there and has become a place of cult worship and pilgrimage. There are plenty of pictures of it online. It's pretty spectacular. Jean-Michael Basquiat, who himself died of a heroin overdose in 1998, would always stay in Bungalow 3 during his trips to Los Angeles. And Johnny Depp, Courtney Love, and Rick James have all stayed there as an homage to Belushi. Uh, And another homage to Obelushi. Let's let uh, Jake and Elwood Blues take us out. Everybody needs somebody. Everybody needs somebody to love. Someone to love. Someone to love. Sweetheart to miss. Sweetheart to miss. Sugar to kiss. 